think that uh, also in terms of management and marketing, you know, we uh, we need to create uh, narratives which uh, are uh, evocative of our identity, which show our personality, and uh, that uh, rely on the behind the scenes. You know? So what's uh, the unique way we do the things that we do, uh, how we do and why we do, no? to see, because it's easy that customers see uh, what we do and even how we do, no? but uh, the reason behind what we do and how we do, it's important not to show, including these behind the scenes processes that not easy to see at some point. I'm very pleased to invite my guest today is uh, Dr. Francesc Fuste Fornere. He is from the professor at the Department of Business at the University of Girona in Spain, which is a very interesting tourist destination by itself already. His research is focused on food and rural marketing and tourism. Particularly, has he has studied the connections between authenticity, food heritages, and identities, landscapes and landscapers, regional development, rural activities, street food, and tourist experiences. He conducts applied research on the role of gastronomy in relation to mass media as a driver of social change. Welcome, Francesc. Thank you very much for joining us today. Hi, Samaric. Many thanks. Uh, and it's a real pleasure being here. I'm very happy to have this conversation with you and, and also hope that uh, all the, the people listening to us uh, will enjoy our, uh, our conversation and discussion today. I'm sure they will. I'm sure the audience is very queued in to these topics and, and I'm very much looking forward to see their comments and questions uh, and their observations on the content uh, that uh, now we are discussing. So, but let's get started. First, I think for our audience to get some background, can you tell me about what inspired you to have a focus on food, gastronomy, in relation to marketing a destination with platforms like Insta Instagram and TikTok? Well, that's a, a difficult question, and it should not be, but it is. Um, I've been working on uh, on food you know, as a topic uh, for a uh, few years ago, since I started my uh, my master's uh, thesis, and then after that with my PhD. And I've been working uh, with food as an element of identity, as an element of culture, also as an element that uh, connects landscapes, landscapes and lifestyles. And uh, there, of course, uh, I've been working also with uh, uh, my colleagues as well uh, with the analysis you know, of how we create uh, or we award value to, to food you know, through tourism and how this can also help um, uh, revitalize and can contribute to the economic, of course, but also social well-being of, uh, of communities, you know, especially in the, the countryside. And uh, and then as part you know, of this analysis based on both product and marketing strategies, we've also uh, developed uh, an interest you know, in how uh, companies and destinations create this connection with uh, users, visitors, customers uh, through the social media platforms. You know? and, and that was the starting point. You know? So we uh, specialized uh, on food and then as part of this analysis you known the uh, strategies that uh, food producers and destinations uh, developed around food. We have started also to analyze you know, how this food is is communicated, is used as an element of storytelling in social media. Yes, very good. I mean, now the, the barrier to uh, post something on social media is so low that it actually, you don't need to have high investments. And so any cafe can actually make a unique, as long as you have the unique story and there's authenticity there, they, they have an a, a ability then to reach a very wide audience. So it's one, a very powerful way of uh, telling their unique story to, to the customer. And I thought now in, with our discussion today, we will take uh, two different routes to how certain destinations are handling this. We will start with uh, United Arab, Emir Arab Emirates, Abu Dhabi, I think there's maybe Dubai involved there. And uh, you have published several research papers and articles on these subjects on, uh, on luxury hotels in UAE, but also uh, bakeries in Catalonia. And I'd like to learn and understand fr from your insights on the role of food in tourism and role of tourism in food, starting with UAE, where visual storytelling has been taken to a very high level. So what kind of visual contents as per your research resonates most effectively 
with consumers looking for those luxury dining experience? Yeah, well, as part of this uh, research, so we uh, I've been collaborating with uh, a colleague uh, in Dubai, uh, which uh, she's uh, Noella Michael, you know, and we have developed uh, together this uh, this analysis you know, of these visual narratives in uh, in uh, the social media strategies of luxury hotels in the United Arab Emirates, and uh, and here there are different elements you know, that. Uh, uh, the hotels builds on you not know, to to create these emotional bonds with customers and also to develop this uh, attraction factor you no know? and and probably the, the one of the most relevant uh, elements is is gastronomy you no know? and how the gastronomy experience within the structure of the hotel is uh, valorized you no know, as a way through which we can protect and promote the local identity for example, through traditional dishes or uh, traditional what foods and drinks, and then also how this can be recreated you know, as part of a luxury uh, component. You no, know, because here we are merging this uh, identity, you not know, embedded in the local culture in the local heritage, with a specific uh, type of uh, service, which is the luxury hotel, which also has a specific target of people, and uh, where we need to to create you no. Know, uh, a different senses, a different meanings where we have uh, observed you know, that, for example, the contents are based on um, elements, you know, for, for example, a specific products that can convey this uh, luxury component, but also dishes, and, uh, and also here how this is uh, transferred you know, to feelings of uh, sophistication, feelings of prestige, but without forgetting the notion of authenticity, which uh, Still remains you no know, as a in the core center of this uh, type of product. Yeah, I mean, considering that these uh, United Arab Emirates uh, is is a, a basically Arab destination with a very strong uh, national identity. However, there are hundreds of maybe thousands of restaurants and cafes that are are uh, from different nationalities, and they are bringing they are bringing a different international food culture into this destination. And the time I was there, I was surprised of certain cafes and restaurants I never heard of that were becoming very famous. And they were not nothing to do with Arabic, but they, they, they brought some luxury elements from the continental Europe. They Obviously, from Spain, they brought some very famous chefs and also from other southern European uh, continents. Uh, what are the most surprising insights regarding consumer engagement with luxury gastronomic content? On social media that emerged from your research. Yeah, here we, we gather some interesting uh, issues. No, and, and one refers to the previous um, comment that you made. No, because uh, we found that of course the, the local identity is part of this uh, visual narrative, but uh, it's also uh, common that this uh, local uh, inspired gastronomic heritage is. Uh, Combined you no, know, with international flavors, so there is a lot of fusion, you no, know, with also of course continental Europe, but also Asian flavors, uh, also Central American uh, traditions, you no, know, that are included in the in the dishes. So it's it's a thing where uh, the gastronomy also sets a dialogue, you no, know, between the local authenticity, the local based culinary identity, and then the international flavors, because also the the hotels are targeting, you no, know, a specific. Uh, as I mentioned, specific audiences, and they have, of course, a global reach you know, within the customer. But specifically, you know, in something that uh, I would like to highlight in terms of this engagement of the, the, the users uh, is that the, the, the hotels try to recreate a, a full scene you know, of luxury through the gastronomy. You know? For example, I, I remember a, a picture where uh, you got a, a table full of dishes, I mean, like a banquette, and then in the background you could see the sunset, and then also in one of the sites uh, there, there was a violinist, like, like uh, also creating you know, a full stage of uh, of uh, luxury, where of course the food is important, but not only the food, you not know, the atmosphere, the lighting, but everything that surrounds you not know, the place where where we eat the food. Literally, is also relevant you not know, to create this uh, this luxury. Yeah. The, considering now the uh, authenticity in luxury experience, how can uh, like these restaurants balance the authentic representation of their offering with their need for a highly curated aesthetic 
uh, on social media, like you mentioned, you have the sunsets of the violence or the harps playing in the background and so on. Yeah, sometimes I suppose you know, that it's uh, difficult not to find the balance you know, between the, the, the food per se and, and the way you need to create this, uh, this engaged storytelling you know, on, on social media. On social media, but I think that uh, they. So the the most important thing, you know, that is that here we do not keep the focus on the on the gastronomy, you know, in, in this case. So if uh, we use like a, a blue cheese, you no, know, as an element that can create this luxury uh, environment, then how we surround, you know, the the experience around the the blue cheese or the lobster or or the tea ceremony it doesn't matter, you no, know, the example, but the, the way you know, we surround the, the landscape that uh, is part of this, uh, this food experience is also important. Not only the natural landscape, of course, there are lots of pictures where they promote you know, the own hotel. You, know, you can see like uh, different experiences within the cafeteria of the hotel, next to the swimming pool, in the own room, you know, which is also, of course, uh, a place where you can really promote luxury, you know, the own luxurious room. And then you have uh, the dishes you know, in, inside the room. So the, the gastronomy uh, discourse you know, uh, also revolves around own facilities of the hotel, you no, know? the hotel and, and the environment, natural environment, but also the facilities within the environment, which also create different points of consumption of this food. Yeah, but a very important part in the social media is that uh, the user generated content, how they perceive this sense of luxury. What are your observations on, or, or comment on the influence of the uh, the user generated content yeah here uh, in the analysis we are focused only on the supply side perspective but we also have uh, an analysis of uh, the pictures which uh, generated more feedback more uh, likes and more comments and here uh, the the pictures that usually generate the highest level of feedback are those which include Beyond food, you no, know, like the examples that I uh, just uh, shared with you, you no. Know? So you have uh, a specific, uh, let's say, the gold cappuccino, you no. Know? But uh, you have the gold cappuccino within the framework of the cafeteria, you no. Know? Or you have a, a, a fruit-based uh, breakfast, but within the framework of the the sea, you no. Know? And and here yes. again, you no, know, the this is where also the customers feel you know, that they are close to the food, but also close you not know, to where. They are enjoying the food. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is uh, maybe if, if there's one single picture that uh, resonated to me about uh, the Dubai or uh, Abu Dhabi was this uh, gold cappuccino or gold latte, where there was this uh, a little bit of gold put in, and uh, somebody was so fascinated that they only went to the hotel because they want to experience this in their in the I think it was Emirates Palace, in fact, that they want to experience this and take a picture and show to their friends. So it was sort of a a uh, wow moment for them. Yes, and, and, and this is another of the drivers you know, that we found uh, in the analysis. You know? So I mentioned, mentioned about sophistication, but it's also about novelty you know, and how we can generate uh, experiences that were not experienced before. You know? And then, of course, novelty also um, relates to hedonism, you know, in this case of uh, products and and. and What's the pleasure we find you know, in this novelty? And of course, the, the gold cappuccino no fits with both. You know, the, the novelty in the sense that we are not used you know, to have a, a cappuccino with a little bit of gold on top. And, and then the moment, you know, the, the, the pleasure of the moment as a, as a source of hedonism you know, that uh, it's uh, embedded in the gold cappuccino as well. Yeah. yeah. How do you foresee the trends in social media marketing, uh, uh, particularly in luxury gastronomy? What, what is what is the how is it evolving in the future? I mean, I noticed uh, a lot of the uh, top chefs, in fact, they are very active uh, on Saturday, cooking uh, at their private kitchen for their uh, audience and and all kinds of things. What are you, what have you seen? Yeah, so actually, we're uh, involved in another project, you no, know, analyzing this uh, social media contents uh, from what perspective, and here as a part of uh, we did. Uh, Series, uh, series of interviews with uh, with chefs in specifically here in Catalonia you know, for another project with another colleague. Uh, uh, he's he's Esther Nogue Junca, 
and, uh, and, and, and as a result no, of these interviews and also of the analysis of uh, social media that we did in parallel, we realized that, uh, I mean, they, they say that uh, the contents that will lead you know, the, the, the future interest uh, from, from customers refer to the, these um, non-planned moments. You know? So as you mentioned, when the chef goes to the market you know, and, and he or she is asking about the seasonal vegetables, and then bring them to the restaurant. No? And this will take the lead. Now, of course, we'll still uh, like to see the dishes and the art and the creative work of the, of the chefs and, and how they perform you know, the stage during the experience. But the, the behind the scenes you know, process, it's, yeah. it's crucial you know, to, to connect, to, this, uh, to develop this emotional connection with the, with the customer. Yeah, now, I remember uh, years ago, I was fascinated. I, I saw a cookbook. Uh, oh, no, it actually was basically uh, an excellent uh, f- a book on phot- f- food photography and was a Japanese chef. He's the chef de Mikuni. And I, I bought this book. And, and I, unfortunately, we never had a chance to go and visit the restaurant. And now we took him fast forward. Uh, the book is, I bought must have been in the, in the early 90s. And he was the big chef in in in, uh, in Japan, and now uh, now we are talking 2024. Now he's he's on uh, Facebook or Instagram, and very casually, uh, no uh, arrogance or no uh, uh, chef manners. He's very like a friendly uh, uncle who is cooking to you or to the audience, and he has a lot of fans, and he's making very simple dishes uh, that anyone can cook. And because this, this is now his success, I think he's sort of a, a second run into success from being a very Michelin star, uh, highly refined, uh, fine dining, now to the uncle who's cooking in the kitchen. It's some very friendly, easy made food. So I was very impressed about how he has moved on to something like this. And social media is now helping him to reach out. And I, maybe you have some examples of what you have seen, how from the sort of the Michelin star activity, you're becoming a little bit more of a the friendly guy who is available to you to show you how to make something. Yeah, actually, there are examples of uh, Michelin star chefs you know, who just uh, left the Michelin restaurant behind and, and left the pressure you know, uh, embedded in this, uh, this uh, well, very competitive uh, wall and started to cook... Uh, this way, no, so as a way to get closer to the people, also to make the product, or the restaurant, more accessible. Because, of course, when we talk about Michelin restaurants, not all of them, but uh, many of them has a specific, uh, have a specific uh, price range, and uh, and we also see, no, that uh, some uh, some of these chefs, uh, while they keep the Michelin restaurant, they also open no new uh, venues, no, and here in Girona. As you know, uh, there is also Yer de Can Roca, and which is the three Michelin star restaurant. But uh, they have also created you no know, range of uh, experiences with uh, uh, ice shop, ice cream shop, uh, also a coffee shop based on chocolate, and uh, also now uh, they have opened a, a normal restaurant which is called Normal in the center of the city. You no, know? so also they uh, offer this uh, Roca experience, but uh, different price ranges. So. More people no, can uh, also um, try you know, this uh, this uh, Roca brand, you know, which is well connected with the Girona identity. You know, at the end, it's a it's a, a synergy you know, that we create uh, with the restaurants. Of course, these Michelin restaurants provide a huge visibility, not only to themselves and the chef, but also to the cities, uh, the regions where they are, you know, because they are also advocates of uh, local of the use of local products, uh, local recipes, and when not trying to reach this uh, or to to broaden you not know, the target audience is uh, I think it's uh, also a, a way you not know, to uh, increase not only the the impact of the of the brand but also to allow people you not know, to engage with this uh, type of uh, experience you know, at the end of course the ice cream shop may not be a luxury experience per se but it, it's part you no know, it's a, a, an element which is also a, a signature element by the Rocco Brothers. 
Well, I think that ice cream shop I, I saw, I have only seen it on YouTube, and I said that I have to visit that place. It is, looks so delicious. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and you see, in the summer, there are uh, queues there. So people just uh, making their waiting time before they get the specific ice cream. And, and here there are, uh, they, they work also with representations of uh, local elements no? and the use of local products. And there is an ice cream which oh. is evocative of, uh, it is called, uh, well, it's a monument in, in Girona. And, uh, and then they, they make it tangible no? through an ice cream where, in addition, they use um, a local product, which is the apple. No? Because the apple in Girona is an identity product, which is also yeah. uh, recognized by a quality label. And they use a sor an apple sorbet to do this, uh, this ice cream. So there are lots of connections, of course, we don't have time uh, to, to discuss all of these <laughs> connections, but these uh, luxury restaurants also uh, protect and promote the connections you know, between sustainable production and sustainable product consumption that we have not discussed, discussed before. Oh, yes, very good. So um, let's move from the luxury uh, bling bling world of uh, UAE to to something which is close to my heart, these bakeries. You made a research on the uh, the case of bakeries in Catalonia. And I think there was a case where, was it during the pandemic period where, uh, and so could you just share the, uh, what were the challenges uh, bakeries faced during the lockdown? Uh, what strategies did you see them using to operate successfully? Uh, and uh, what were your findings? Yes, we developed this uh, project uh, during the, the pandemic with uh, my colleague Nella Filimon, and uh, and we uh, analyzed. You no, know, on one side we interviewed the, the managers of the bakeries to see how they uh, were adapting to the new situation, and also through different stages because uh, there were different stages of lockdown, and then also we um, analyzed you no know, how they uh, promoted uh, the bakeries on, on social media. You know? And here, uh, one uh, issue you know, that it was common for, for all the bakeries was that, uh, well, these bakeries in particular, you know, we analyzed bakeries which uh, uh, also had uh, uh, cafeteria space. So uh, there is a, a double result here. You know? So from the sense of the bakery, they all agreed, you know, they all understand, understood that uh, bread is a basic need. So they, they also highlighted you know, this role as a um, city protectors you know, to some extent in the sense that uh, they needed to to to, um, to bake the bread every day and to open every day so they can uh, also um, meet you not know, of course the customer needs in relation to this uh, this product and and all the products you know, that are part of the of the bakeries and then also the situation that came as a result of the closure of the cafeterias, no? which in most cases is the element that provides uh, more revenue. No? And, uh, and this also mean, meant that uh, they, they had a, a difficult time no? in finding a balance no? between a situation where they, they needed to be open because as a basic uh, facility, they needed to continue to provide uh, the bread even in the most difficult days of the pandemic. Uh, also including personal situations you know, in the own uh, businesses. And then this combined you know, with, the, with the loss of most of the revenue coming from the, the cafeterias. And here, uh, of course, uh, we, I mentioned in the previous uh, um, research, you know, this connection between sustainable production and consumption, and this is really manifested here. You know, so how the bakeries managed to to keep you know, this artisanal production of, uh, of bread, this artisanal uh, handmade bread that they do at their own uh, workshops, and then uh, how this is communicated you know, through, the, through the different channels they have, including social media, with some challenges that we now can discuss, uh, but also to preserve you know, the identity, one of the elements uh, that uh, also can be the identity of the cities. No? So at the end, the bakeries are part of the city branding. They are a crucial business within the city structure. And, uh, and, and they recognize that you know, when we talk to them, they are aware you know, that they are a crucial facility within, within the food uh, system. Yeah. 
I mean, uh, during the lockdown, there was, there was, of course, I mean, uh, those bakeries who were on social media, they reached uh, almost everyone. But then you have the senior citizens who may not be social media savvy, and they were used to go and get their bread every day, and then, then they were not able to get the bread every day. So how, how did they, how did, uh, how did uh, the seniors were educated or to adapt to the situation where daily habits had to be changed? Yeah, actually, this was also a point that they they highlighted. No, uh, there is a crucial difference here. No, because uh, we've mentioned in the luxury experience examples that uh, the the social media no is used as a way to uh, promote you no know, the the business per se, and here the the social media is used also as a way to create awareness about the product in the sense that uh, it's used more as an information channel than a promotion channel. No, and this also relates to what you just mentioned. So, yeah, they needed to change you know, some of the production dynamics, for example, making larger pieces of bread. And also they needed to do a lot of um, conversation, you know, let's say, in that uh, way, a lot of uh, connect, uh, strengthening this connection with the, the people who came there and, and maybe uh, were not uh, supposed not to come every day, as you said. Uh, and then the, the bakeries uh, needed to to well work on on these uh, production changes, not to also influence on the consumption changes. No, if uh, if they are making like pieces of bread which last for three days instead of one day, this also requires no that the customer understands it and also sets no the the situation. No, of course they they didn't uh, the bakeries didn't mention that uh, the rules that they were setting as part of the lockdown were not followed or, or nothing like that. No, but they try it not to also make the cost, cost customers aware of this change you know, in the production, which also leads to change in the consumption. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, during the, I think the, the pandemic uh, taught us and everyone uh, many lessons. And uh, what lessons can maybe the small and medium enterprise learn from how these bakeries managed their operation during various stages of pandemic because there are there, some lessons that to be learned from that. Yeah. So, so one of the lessons you know, that uh, was learned, uh, it, it, it refers to the process of adaptation and, and resilience. You know? and, uh, and for example, when uh, they told you know, about this uh, closure of the cafeterias, uh, they of course increased the takeaway services and they also increased the delivery services. There is one one bakery, you know, that uh, they were providing their own delivery service to uh, to the countryside you know, of the area here in Girona. So they allowing people in a specific town you not know, to make a, um, a joint order, and then they delivered directly to the to the town the, this order. You know? So they created different uh, adaptation strategies, which also saw show. The, release, the resilience, the capacity of resilience no, that they have, and and this resilience is also a way not to communicate uh, the the customers know how uh, how they perform and what is the, their identity. You no, know? because when we do something, we also show you no know, how we are and what's our personality. And when we post on social media, you no, know, if it's, if it's a bakery or a luxury hotel or uh, an individual, we also are showing you not know, through a specific post how we are and, and who we are. You no, know? and 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 this is also important in terms of these uh, actions that the bakeries developed uh, to to uh, to protect you no know, and promote the identity the specific identity of uh, entrepreneurship through a product which is also an identity product uh, and also in, in connection in close connection with the with the people you no know, which uh, at the end is uh, are, the people are at the center you know, of the of the of any product or any service you know, that we want to to promote yeah, was there any difference in in the gender you know, of the bakery managers uh, who were uh, more inclined to use successfully social media and more comfortable to to do that? Was there any difference, or uh, did you notice any of that? Well, uh, the the managers we interview uh, they were uh, female managers, so uh, this also not shows no that uh, some of these um, some of these um, Actions you know, that I, I mentioned you know, could be gender-based, uh, and 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 also 
uh, re resonates no, with the with this uh, people centered approach no, of the of these businesses. In terms of social media, here there were there were different strategies and uh, and there were some of the bakeries that they were really engaging in social media, but other bakeries who are not really active in, in social media and they use like personal communication tools like WhatsApp, so to keep the the customers also up to date of what uh, was happening. Um, but what of uh, all of them no. Uh, Use these uh, these communication channels to increase you no know, these emotional bonds you no know, with the customers. At the end, of course, it's about information, about uh, telling people you no know, that uh, they are there and the bread is ready. Maybe not every day, but every three days, you no know, to 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 be uh, to be bought. But also, of course, then as a, as in a promotion element, you no, know, which uh, as as the pandemic or, or as the restrictions were being waived. No, we observe that uh, this uh, promotional element, you know, it's again gaining uh, importance in the narratives. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Well, I'm a fan of good bread, and you, could you share your findings how this Spanish route of a route of good bread worked pro to promote the destination? Because I understand there's a program in uh, in Spain. Yeah, there is a route, uh, and this route uh, is a, a way. No, so. How we can award you know, this value to to bread, uh, focus on uh, artisanal uh, production techniques. You know? So how can we uh, use uh, handmade products as a way towards uh, slow tourism, also as a way towards regenerative tourism, and also uh, understanding you know, the context, this local global context where we are, you know, where uh, this uh, industrial based uh, food also makes uh, the way. To the to the retailing uh, sector, and uh, and this this route you no know, is an effective uh, way you not know, to not only to allow people to know about this artisanal bread, but also to keep the bakeries you know, on the on the process you know, of trying to improve the techniques while while maintaining the traditional uh, traditional way of making bread and using uh, local and quality ingredients because they also organize competitions and. Uh, then the bakeries use you know, these uh, awards as a, as a tool to promote themselves. Very good. Yeah, so that's that's very, very interesting. I mean, this is, gives a... Uh, I read somewhere that uh, uh, there are 20% of travelers tend to... Uh, when they plan a holidays, it's all around about food. So anyone who... when If they, are, uh, if they see a, some sort of a program or a... Uh, idea of where they can actually have an enjoyable holiday and and also to taste something new different things than and everybody loves bread so i think this is this idea of the the, the catalonian wrote wrote different visiting different bakeries could be a wonderful way of seeing a, a part of uh, uh, catalonia that you'd never will see otherwise exactly and and, and here there are also different um, strategies no from an entrepreneurship perspective, uh, where we can connect bread with other products. No, and now, uh, for example, in, in autumn, they make a chestnut bread you know, using like chestnuts uh, or uh, pumpkin bread using the, the pumpkin. And, uh, and it's also similar with other products like cheese, for example, you know, where we can really create uh, relationships between producers, where uh, through bread, in this case, we can also protect and promote you know, other local products, which uh, also form you know, the, the destination. And uh, as you mentioned, so there are lots of uh, visitors uh, who uh, has uh, food as a primary motivation. But uh, even if food is not a primary motivation, we all of us uh, we eat you no know, when we travel. So and and here also there is also potential you not know, to. Uh, Increase the competitiveness of the destinations you know, based on these food experiences, and also the seasonality attached to the food experiences. Yeah, very good. Okay, that's very good. So we talked about uh, the luxury, luxury gastronomic experience, and also the case of uh, Catalonia bakeries. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, your observations and uh, and also your article how underutilized uh, short form videos are and after all they provide a way to deliver a message quickly and efficiently uh, what are your thoughts on 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 these short forms is it the, our 
attention span is about uh, like a goldfish or is it or is it, what are the things that uh, drives the message very clearly and all the challenges related that you have to you have to fit everything within a certain time frame yeah these short forms of videos you no know, as we observe in Instagram on Instagram as well and also on, on TikTok uh, they are driving now the new trend, well, new kind of new trend in uh, promoting uh, also tourism destinations and, and services. And um, yeah, we did also a small analysis you know, of the experiences with my colleague, my colleague uh, Alicia Orea Ginet. And, um, and we analyzed you know, how uh, destinations worldwide started to uh, use you know, these uh, short video forms you know, to promote uh, the food experiences. Here, there are also different preliminary results. On one side, you know, we, we also find this result uh, that revolves around identity, but around identity in connection with uh, these global influences. You know? And of course, uh, here we promote this uh, fusion uh, gastronomic experiences you know, where at the end, restaurants uh, usually dialogue, create a dialogue you know, between tradition and innovation, between local and global ingredients. And that doesn't mean that we lose authenticity, you know, but uh, I mean, as culture uh, itself is, uh, is not static, it's dynamic, and food as part of culture is also dynamic, you know, and, uh, and we also need to, uh, well, dialogue, you know, with the different elements that shape and are shaped by our, our own food culture and our own food identity. But uh, one element, you know, that we specifically find in these short forms of uh, videos is uh, this uh, idea of out of ordinary, you know? So how we create these unique experiences, these memorable experiences. And I remember one video, I think it was from uh, from uh, London Cafe, where they uh, promoted a big croissant, you know? And, and, and the people went there, just uh, tried, uh, I mean, big, it's like really big croissant. Uh, and then uh, you got the, the latte, you know? And you tried to, to dip the big croissant in the latte. And, so they promote it as this out of ordinary experiences. To some extent, something similar than the Gold Cappuccino, no, that we talk uh, at the beginning. Yeah. And uh, this really, this really works, uh, but also works uh, in relation to this behind the scenes, no, that we also talk as part of the luxury experience. No? And uh, what what happens, no, uh, before and after we dip the the big croissant. Yeah. I also like like I have seen on Instagram. Uh, I I have I followed many of the uh, uh, patissiers and bakers and so on. And there is one particular uh, patissier in Paris uh, who is very often on on Instagram. And he he makes those reels, uh, or they are very quite short. And the way they are very cleverly, uh, he shows the whole production in in very few seconds because the way they have. Uh, shot the video, and then the more the more important thing is once he's completed and he has a taste of the the pie, whatever he make, and it looks obviously very delicious. And then the next scene is that he's taking a tray and th- taking it outside his shop, and you have a huge line of people just standing there to get a taste of this. And he has become a, a almost like a, a, a attraction for the center of Paris, where, where people are going to. To visit that area just to have a piece of that, and there's obviously no seats to 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 his bakery cafes unless you book in months in advance. So you know, so it's interesting how different, cleverly uh, curated uh, uh, videos and so on, and using that time a very short time to promote the point point makes it can be, make it very successful. But you have to be very active and continuously come up with new ideas. Exactly, and I and actually I think that this is uh, crucial. No, it's of course, the, the, the way you create the image or the video, it's important, but the idea behind it, you know, it uh, is what it makes the picture or the video possible you know, and, and how uh, we really identify you know, a value proposition which is unique and can create uh, an out of ordinary experiences that is worth uh, traveling to. Yeah, exactly. Well, we're going to jump over to Greenland for a moment uh, with the taking a different approach here. So, uh, and this will be formed as part of uh, episode two with you, Francesc. So we are, episode one is about the culinary bakeries and luxury uh, restaurants and uh, 
and we touched on so many things, but now uh, the portrayal of Greenland, a visual analysis of its digital storytelling. Could you elaborate on the main themes of observing Greenland's digital storytelling? Uh, uh, because you made an article about this. Yes, we uh, analyzed you know, the visual storytelling of Greenland from the perspective of the destination. So uh, as a way you not know, to understand how Greenland, Greenland wants uh, the world to see at, you know, and, and, and uh, here, well, we, fa- we found some uh, things which may sound obvious, you know, that uh, is, uh, is uh, environmental um, driving content, so where nature is the, the main uh, factor you know, that is used in this storytelling, but also the forms that nature takes. You know, and here we observe the mountains, so we observe, of course, ice, snow, water, and, uh, and all of these uh, environmental elements you know, that uh, convince Greenland as a nature, nature-based destination. Yeah. How do you compare? I mean, if you compare, like, uh, uh, Greenland is a very exotic to a lot of people, and most people haven't been there. But then, then you're looking at uh, the digital storytelling of Greenland to maybe other popular destinations. Are there any unique aspects of to Greenland's narrative? Yeah, I mean, uh, here there could be other examples you know, of uh, destinations where also this storytelling is also built on on nature. You no, know? but of course this uh, this uh, environmental um, factors you not know, contributing to the landscapes and lifestyles of Greenland are uh, crucial you not know, to portray Greenland uh, in on these uh, social media platforms. But if I think about uh, the most uh, specific element to the storytelling, I, I would say this uh, culture in nature concept that they uh, that they communicate. You know? So they often portray you know, the, the immensity of the nature uh, through these uh, snow landscapes, also the water and the ice. But then it's also often that we see in the pictures the colorful houses you know, that form these small villages. And, and this could be like the identity image. You know? So a small village with uh, colorful houses in some uh, a small place in the picture, and then all the other parts of the picture, the immensity of nature. And yeah. probably this shows you know, of uh, the, the, the small role of people within the big place of nature you know, that Greenland is. Yeah, absolutely. There's an, uh, there's an interesting uh, YouTube channel uh, from Greenland, which I follow, and uh, they're, they're making uh, these shorts. They, and they make, in, in 60 seconds, they tell you uh, the uh, national dress of, of Greenland and what, what's the difference with them. And so they give you a very wide aspect. So uh, I'm jumping a little bit into the YouTube aspect. You see that YouTube is also a very powerful medium for uh, compared to the TikToks and the Instagrams, or maybe it's reaching a different audience, or how, how do you see it? Yeah, yeah, I think that uh, with the emergence and consolidation of Instagram, uh, and then also the use of TikTok uh, with these short forms of videos, uh, makes YouTube you no know, targeting different audiences with uh, more uh, paused you no know, uh, contents uh, where you can. Um, Engage you now in a different manner with the way to create this storytelling, and of course there are lots of destinations uh, that combine you no, know, but but channels, but the type of content uh, is uh, it's different for sure, and also the target audience they have. Sure, sure. So I mean, you made you have made extensive research here. What recommendations would you give to Greenland's tourism marketeers to enhance their storytelling technique for a digital audience or are they do, are they doing something that uh, maybe they can do better or uh, what are your thoughts um well greenland is uh, an adventure based destination also is a destination for tourist tourists and of course this is framed no within this nature based uh, tourism attraction but uh, one element you know, that we uh, find that is underrepresented for example in the visual narratives is gastronomy no, and uh, well, we were looking you know, at the overall image that they create, and uh, we've we found that uh, they have very limited numbers of pictures you know, showing this uh, 
food uh, heritage role in tourism. And probably, uh, given that uh, they are um, opening you know, to uh, welcoming more tourists in the in the near future, uh, gastronomy, you know, as part of uh, the Greenlandic culture, could be a, a way, you know, to protect and promote also the Greenlandic identity. Not beyond nature, but as part of nature, no? because food as, uh, as well is uh, really connected with nature. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree. Well, I have, uh, uh, Francesc, this has been a very, very interesting discussion because we've been jumping and you've very, very graciously been, uh, you're coping with my uh, jumping from uh, different destinations uh, very nicely. But I have uh, two more questions for you before we wrap up. Uh, one question I, uh, that I always ask my guests, besides what we have talked about, what are the, some trends that you see happening in hospitality that uh, the ho hospitality professionals should take note of now? Well, I would say two, two things. No, one, one thing is um, that we need to be creative uh, to keep a balance between high-tech and high-touch because hospitality and tourism uh, are industries or systems uh, which... Uh, rely on uh, high touch component and now the high tech tech component has been uh, increased the role you know, that uh, it plays in both the production and the consumption of experiences and then and, and we need to think you know, about how to uh, balance you know, both, both elements and the other thing is that uh, also in terms of management and marketing you know, we uh, we need to create uh, narratives which uh, are uh, evocative of our identity, which show our personality, and uh, that uh, rely on the behind the scenes. No? So what's uh, the unique way we do the things that we do, uh, how we do and why we do, no? to see, because it's easy that customers see uh, what we do and even how we do, no? but uh, the reason behind what we do and how we do, it's important not to show, including these behind the scenes processes that not easy to see at some points. Well, thank you. Uh, and my final question, if, uh, if people are interested to find out more about your work, uh, how can they reach you and where can they find you to read about your articles and, and, and communicate? So um, I'm happy that they can uh, find on my research gate uh, and also at my university profile at the University of Girona, they will also find my email if they want to share their thoughts or comment on, on anything. Well, thank you. My guest today was uh, uh, Francesc Fusté Fournet, and he talked about the social media aspects and utilization of social media for, uh, uh, in, in, during the different uh, stages. One was the pandemic for the Catalonian bakery and also the luxury uh, culinary experiences in, in the United Arab Emir Emirates. So, uh, Francesc, it has been really a pleasure. And so thank you very much for taking the time. I truly enjoyed uh, this discussion and, I, and I'm looking very much forward to uh, find a nice episode again and topic to talk to you again. Thank you so much. Many thanks, Amerik, for the invitation and all the people for listening. It's uh, been my pleasure to be here today.